then what was the basis of your, if you weren't re reviewing reports or listening to your prior statement, what kind of discussions were you having about your testimony today with the prosecutor? He told me that he wanted me to testify in this proceeding. Okay. My statement with him is I can't tell you anything because I was asleep. Because you were what, ma'am? Sleep. Sleep, okay. And I proceeded to tell him at some point I don't believe Stanley could have done that because he had two small children of his own. Okay. So you let the prosecutor know that when you were getting ready to testify, correct? Yes. That's a witness for the prosecution saying she doesn't think that the defendant could have done it. Wow. Pretty big moment. Good moment for the defense for Stanley Ford in Akron, Ohio, accused of setting two fires, killing nine people, including five children, facing the death penalty. Well, uh, let's take a listen to a little more uh, from that witness. Her name's Audrey Taylor. She's a neighbor of the defendant, lives in that neighborhood. That's what this whole trial is about, what was going on in that neighborhood. Here she is on direct. Before that fire, do you recall ever having a conversation with the defendant, Stanley Ford, about the residents of that house? He mentioned to me on my way to the gas station um, that there was a, a little boy that lived in the house that was breaking off rear car rear view mirrors i mean the side view mirror sorry and um do you know how old the boy was he was talking about or referring to he didn't stanley did not tell me an age of the boy i kind of figured the boy was between Seven and ten, okay. okay? But the age of the boy, I did not know. Okay. Did you know the boy who he was referring to? No, I did not. All right. And um, when you were speaking to him about this, about the, the boy breaking off mirrors from the cars, um, what was the defendant's demeanor? How was he about this? Was he happy about this? Was he upset about this? Was a slight bit agitated. Slight bit agitated. All right, well, what was really going on in this neighborhood? And, and more importantly, what is the impression that this jury is getting about this neighborhood and what the neighborhood thinks of Stanley Ford? Because this is an absolute devastating accusations here. I mean, murdering nine people, five children burning alive. This is... The worst of the worst you're talking about. Let's bring in Court TV crime and justice reporter Joy Lim Nakrin, who is joining us live from Akron, Ohio tonight. Joy, what, what is the overall impression, right? You know, they're hearing from a lot of these different neighbors. As we sit here tonight, what has this jury heard about what the neighborhood thinks about Stanley Ford? Because we all live in neighborhoods and we all kind of, you know, talk about this one and that one, right? Uh, what is this jury going to take away from what Stanley Ford's neighbors think about him? Right. Well, I mean, it's really a mixed bag, Vinny, as you really summarize by playing those clips there. You know, on one hand, these neighbors, we seem to hear the theme over and over again. Uh, they observe some tensions between Stanley Ford and these victims. And in fact, uh, we've heard testimony over and over again from these neighbors that he actually took issue with those victims who happened to be killed in these arsons. But at the same time, we heard the neighbor today, Audrey Taylor, testify she didn't believe that Stanley 
Ford actually committed these crimes. And last week, we heard from two other neighbors, both of whom happen to be Christian, who live quiet lifestyles, who say that Ford actually was, was nice to them. And so I, I guess the picture that we're getting is sort of, of a dichotomy. A, 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 a man, Stanley Ford, who thinks of himself as a, as a guardian of the neighborhood, uh, according to one of those neighbor witnesses, saw himself as an angel of God sent to protect the neighborhood. And, and so for the neighbors who he looks at in a positive way, uh, according to them, you know, he was, he was very kind to them. Uh, but yet we do keep hearing this theme that he took issue with uh, the behaviors going on at the home of Linda Lewis and Gloria Hart, that he took issue. You hear him allegedly complaining to this witness about a child who was ultimately killed in that 2017 house fire, which killed five children, a whole family of seven. So a complex view that we're getting of Stanley Ford, a uh, really sort of a, a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type character, if you will. And were there any other suspects in this investigation? Well, that is what the defense is arguing, right? Uh, they are really trying to broaden the circle of suspicion here. We hear them question numerous witnesses about other individuals in the neighborhood who were maybe engaged in illicit activity. We've heard the name Macklemore come up. Uh, we first heard, first heard it from a witness last week uh, referring to Macklemore having started a, a first fire at Lindell Lewis's home, and we heard about Macklemore again today during cross-examination of former Akron police detective Tanisha Stewart as well. And, and that's one of the individuals who the defense really questioned her very hard on, essentially insinuating that she did not adequately investigate these other potential suspects. All right, let's take a listen to a little bit of that cross-examination. I think it's a very significant part of this case. Ronald Garrett, the guy that lived in the basement with Thomas Hugley, you find him four days later, you interview him, correct? Yes. You ask him about his whereabouts that night, don't you? Yes. And you get information that he's at his niece's house, correct? He went to a niece's house, an aunt's house, and then later, I think it's his child's mother's house. Yeah. You learn that he spends the night at Gloria Lee's and Fowler building on Byers, apartment 611. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. And that's a high rise, correct? Yes. It's an older folks home, correct? Yes. And I believe it's in Highland Square, if I'm not mistaken. It is. Okay. He tells you that's where he was that night, right? Yes. Do you, during the course of your investigation, go and speak to Gloria Lee, the, the person whose house he stayed at? I did not. Um, it's my recollection that uh, because there's officers that work there that, you know, sometimes detectives, we don't do everything. We do okay. delegate some things, but that um, and what I really wanted to capture were video images or something like that for him coming in and out. Sure. Um, and so I could not necessarily solidify to my liking. Um, where he spent his night. Okay, so the question is, did you ever speak to Gloria Lee? I did not. All right, let's bring back in our think tank. We've got three great criminal defense attorneys, Renee Hill, Carmen Rowe, Molly Palmer with us. Uh, uh, Molly, when, when you all get together at your conventions, the criminal defense conventions, um, do you have like a seminar that teaches you shoddy investigation, rush to judgment, and tunnel vision? Well, um, not explicitly, Vinny, but I will say that all of those are contributing factors to wrongful convictions. And so as defense lawyers, we certainly want to look into that when we investigate a case and see why maybe our client is actually innocent. But I think in this case, the investigator, she did pretty well on the stand because she mentioned not rushing to judgment, actually. She mentioned that she didn't go ahead and arrest Mr. Ford until she felt she had a better, better handle on the evidence. So I actually think in this case, She's fairly credible and actually did a, a decent job for the state. All right. Um, uh, Carmen Rowe, we're going to have the producers record that because we all, we all <laughs> witnessed that. Molly just said the investigator did a good job and was credible. Decent job. Decent, decent, decent job. All right. Uh, Carmen, you know, and, and this is, I always see it as like, and I learned this as a young prosecutor going against a very experienced defense attorney, it was no matter what, my investigators did, it was going to be wrong. 
right? Mm -hmm. You know, if it takes three months to solve a case, they couldn't solve this case for three months. Of course, there's reasonable doubt. You solve it within 48 hours, it's a rush to judgment. So, so I learned that very early on. Um, is that true? Do investigators always go too fast or too slow? Absolutely. There's no question. There's always something wrong. There's always more to do. But, you know, in this case, I got to tell you, the defense is doing a fantastic job of suggesting that there's a, possibly a drug deal gone wrong, that there are other suspects out there that they didn't follow up on. And make no mistake, this is a death penalty case. And so this one's too close to call. And in my mind, when that is the issue before this jury, I mean, the tie goes to the runner. You got to give it to this defendant. So I think they're doing a fantastic job in a very difficult case where, again, we have life and death literally on the line for this defendant. And so the defense is doing a tremendous job with each one of these witnesses suggesting there's a lot of reasonable doubt in this case. And, and Renee, that's why it is much more difficult to be a prosecutor, because as a prosecutor, you have to not only prove that the defendant did it, you have to sort of prove that other people didn't do it. You've got to eliminate all those other alternative suspects or theories of the case. Yeah, well, certainly when the evidence points to other people or the possibility of other suspects, then you absolutely have to prove to the jury that it could not have been any of those other individuals and that the person you have on trial is the one who actually committed the crime. So, you know, prosecutors have that burden and they get the evidence and the information from their investigators and they do what they will with it, and the defense does what we do with it as well. And when it's lacking, we make sure that the jury knows it's lacking. Yep, and that's your job. Hold those prosecutors to the proof. Got to do it, Molly. Got to do it. All right. <laughs>